Hello, Olivia. How are you? Hear me? Good. Good morning. Hello, Kyle. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. There's George. Excellent. Hi, George. How's it going? Going okay. My kids are off at school today, so no annoying violin playing in the background. Just, it's good, but lonely. It's yeah. Cool to be here all by myself after being around everyone all the time. It's a little bizarre. It's like I could I could watch Netflix all day long. Oh, okay. All right, we are recording. Excellent. George, do you and Kyle want me to bring up the uh, discussion board questions or do you already have everything kind of set up? I've got it on my phone, so I'm okay. Okay, great. Excellent. <sighs> so what are you all doing for Thanksgiving? Are you gonna get back with your families again or are you staying on campus? What's going on? I'm going home for Thanksgiving. So right. after next week, I'll just go home for the semester. And do you, are you planning on getting together with extended family or do you think? I think it's just gonna be close family. Yeah. Do you usually have like a big Thanksgiving get together? Yeah, normally my family does. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of sad. My mom is um, one of 10 you know, a big Catholic family and, and most of her brothers and sisters, all of whom had multiple children, um, they've stuck close to St. Louis, most of them. And so when we get together, it's my mom's generation, my generation, and then that generation has had children and some of those children have had children. It's probably close to 75 people. And uh, we're not, obviously we can't do, we haven't been able to see each other for almost a year now. Very sad, very, very, very sad. All right, I think I think everybody is here. If, if uh, Kyle and George want to begin um, and uh, I'll just let you kind of take it over and if anyone has any questions or comments, let me know. Go home, stay home and sleep. <laughs> Amen, Laura, I hear you. Go home, stay home and sleep. Um, oh, you can't, Alexia, you can't stay during Thanksgiving. Are, are they going to close down the entire campus, I guess? Ooh. I didn't know that. Alexia, do you have some place to stay over Thanksgiving? I hope so. Yes, yes. Okay, good. I was going to say, we have a, a fold-out bed in our... <laughs> in our TV room. It's not very comfortable, but it's yours, Alexia, if you needed some place to stay over Thanksgiving break. Oh, there I think you you're able to stay on campus because I remember filling out a survey about like what days I'll be on campus during Thanksgiving. So I think okay. it is an option. You were just supposed to like fill that out before then. Okay, yeah, I've been, I've been getting conflicting messages. Some, um, some of my associate deans seem to suggest that I'm still supposed to go to the classroom after Thanksgiving. And I'm like, I, I don't think I'm supposed to, right? It's supposed to be all on. So I'm, I'm a little confused about, I know that students aren't supposed to come to class anymore after Thanksgiving, but, and I'm really hoping I don't have to go to class anymore Thanksgiving. I'd rather just stay home in my PJs, honestly. Awesome. All right. So George, Kyle, take it away. It's all you. I'm going to put myself on mute. So for question one, the question read, on page 72-73, the actors came back on stage after the boy had been shot. Why did some of the actors call out saying reality? Why did some of the actors call out saying fiction? What is the significance of this? Do, they, do you believe the boy is actually dead? Explain your answer using direct quotes. So I'll kind of read off my response, and then we'll kind of just take it from there. So I said, I think the actors claim the boy is being shot as fiction because they believe the boy isn't real. 
Um, mm -hmm. They kind of see these these characters materialize, like they see uh, they see the uh, the lady who owns the prostitution room. They see her just show up out of like thin air, and so they've kind of got this like skeptical like view of everything going on. Um, Parandello tells us that these were leftover characters from a story that was never finished. So they don't. So like you can infer that these characters don't have like a, a like they're not really real. They're just kind of like you're stuck somewhere essentially. And um, we know the story isn't finished. It's not. Um, it's not probable for them to be. I said that I don't think they're real because I don't think it's probable that these characters could just show up out of almost nowhere and be real characters. So I don't think um, the boy is really dead. I kind of took it as an illusion of reality. It's this perception that um, as characters are trying to like elude that they're real, but. And I don't think that they are. Excellent. Anybody else want to jump in? What do you all think? Oh, am I still on? I, uh, I don't think they're real either. Um, I kind of had the same interpretation where, like, you know, some of them probably realized that they might have been real because they went, you know, like the kid shot himself. Um, however, what what kind of I argue too, is that they they do kind of appear out of thin air and just as they appear out of thin air the the director just kind of walks away from the situation he's just kind of like you know like I'm out of here like he doesn't really he's not concerned with it so I guess that kind of I don't know how to like interpret it I think like I think it could all be an illusion but I'm not a hundred percent on that. So we've got two votes for it was more illusion than it was real. Anybody want to argue the opposite? Do you think that that the illusion became a reality? I kind of want to argue somewhere, it's like someplace in between. So whenever you reread a story or rewrite a movie, those characters are alive until their death. So by having a character having the children die it's again going back to that uh how people perceive things and how we uh interpret the illusions that we come across like i said when you re-watch something or reread something those characters are alive until they're dead so mm -hmm. just like how if we were to reread this play all over again those children would be alive again so they are it's kind of like uh, uh Schrodinger's cat it's yeah. either alive or dead. Well, nice. they're kind of both, actually. Yeah, yeah. So Schrodinger's cat, she's alluding to um, a kind of quantum physics. It's a, an, an actual experiment. Um, I mean, Schrodinger did it to show how ridiculous our, our reality would be, the one that we can see and interact with, how ridiculous our reality would be if it followed the same rules as quantum physics. So we all know this, right? We all know that, that the rules that we see, that seem to govern our seeable, knowable world are not the same rules that govern um, our smallest, smallest particles. And this has been driving physics crazy for, you know, I mean, this is why Einstein died a, a very sad man. He wanted there to be a, a comprehensive universe. He wanted it to make total sense. He wanted it to be nice, you know, like nicely understandable. Does that make sense, everybody? And after experiment after experiment in the 19, the early 1900s kept showing that the, at the smallest, tiniest level, the rules are 180. And so that for Schrodinger's cat, it's, you know, literally that cat is both alive and that cat is both dead at the same time. And it's not until somebody sees that, that you open up the bunker or the, the box or whatever, and you look into it. It's not until you do that action of looking that you're forcing reality onto those particles, basically. And so the question is, you know, again, on a very real level, George and Kyle, I mean, this is like freaky, freaky, freaky stuff on the scientific level. But again, what is our reality? Does our reality exist? Um, it, like objectively, like in its own reality or only until somebody sees it, until somebody views it, right? So those two kids were sort of following, they never spoke. They were like, they're always pressing up against their mother. Do you notice that? Like throughout the whole play, until the end, until they acted out their deaths. And then at that ending scene, those two figures are gone, right? There's a eerie light behind all the characters. Everyone's there except those two children. 
And they were all sort of leading up to the point where these two, two kids die, basically. And, um, and at that point, then that does become a reality. Why? Because we've all seen it. We've all watched it. We've, we've participated in making that reality. So again, Parandello existentialism, what they're trying to say is that this idea that we can experience reality as it is, is it's impossible. You know, maybe there is a reality that exists, like for physics, you know, physicists, maybe there is a reality where all of this all makes sense at the same time. We just don't know what that, we, we're just incapable of experiencing that particular all-inclusive reality. And so for, again, like literally those, those deaths of those, you know, we participated. I know, and it's really creepy as you're watching it because you can feel like you don't want to see it either. Like the characters don't really want to watch their, you know what I mean? The son was like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go outside. I don't want to, because when he sees it, it becomes a reality. And you in the audience are like, I don't want to see this either, you know? Because once we've seen it, then it's real. Before it can just be sort of like this half imagined thing, right? But once, it's like, it's really creepy because once you participate, it's like we, all of us viewing this, all of us reading this, we make it happen. Cool. So we're kind of complicit, why, yeah. Right. I think it's kind of why Parandello, he also like doesn't explicitly state, you know, this, is, this isn't reality. It's just how you see it because he wants the reader to think about it and kind of go, well, is it because I'm in this moment because I'm reading it because there's this perception that it's real or is it just is it just just illusion and it's all in my mind so like he could have if he wanted to he could have just expressed exactly what it was but he wants he wants the reader to kind of think about it and go well what is this and it kind of goes back to what um Kafka's like metamorphosis with like the bug he didn't explain what the bug was because he wants you to think about it and so it's the same he offers this like challenging perspective where the characters in his own story are conflicting on if, what they believe it to be because they want us to think about it yeah absolutely can yeah. I input something that I kind of like thought about? What if some of the actors were calling it real because they've experienced something similar to it, so they derive it from their experience? And other actors, you know, they never experienced something that traumatic, so they're just like, oh, well, it's obviously fiction because that only happens in the movies. So maybe it was based on how, you know, like, because our, our experiences are kind of like shape us into like what we think. Yeah, exactly. So in a way, some of the actors maybe have experienced something similar to it. So they disagree with the other actors. That's just maybe, I just thought of that just now, so. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that um, this really ties into like what the father was trying to convey throughout the play. Like when he says, I, I shall rather be even apart from the face what he interprets me to be as he feels I am. Because these actors, they don't objectively know what happened. And yet they're still saying reality and fiction and like it just goes to show that like you're not anything except what other people interpret you to be like the only person that knows who you are is yourself so like if you rely on these other people to play you or even like in the real world just like judge you like applying it's like the real world like if you let other people judge you and like you take that to heart like then it's gonna end up bad for you because they don't objectively know you and yeah, that's just what I thought about the situation yeah absolutely and yet at the same time we need them to, you know, we need other people in order to know that we exist. You know what I mean? Like if you shut yourself away, Kyle, from all social interaction, will that really be you either? You know what I mean? Like, and so there is this kind of like idea of like inner subjectivity is an important part of knowing us as a subject, but it's always that tension. That's why Sartre is saying, you know, hell is other people, right? Like um, at the same time, we, because, because we have that need because we don't know, I mean, what is our reality unless we can see it somehow. And the only way for us to really see ourselves is sometimes reflected in the eyes of other people. Like, you know, we need that mirror. Um, and it's really creepy. It's really asking us to, you know, and that's what the father keeps saying, right? He's like, who are you? Tell me who you are, you know? And he's asking the director, who are you? And it, to me, that's a really creepy part of this play is like, oh. I don't know, who am I? I don't know, <laughs> you know? And I asked you to, to, I love your pictures, by the way, the photos of your of you. Um, I asked it, you know, to really think back, look at some photos of you as a baby, look at some photos of you even 10, 15 years ago. And, you know, we, we have been told, you know, it is, it is part of our framework to think of ourselves as always, you know, well, that's me when I was 10, but what does that mean to say I, that was me? You know, <laughs> like, I mean, of course there's, Right. And so a lot of, you know, what, what we think connects us to that person 
in that photograph is the story. It's a narrative in our brain. It's the story we tell about our bodies changing over time. Does that make sense? It's all really a narrative. Who we are, the I, is this story. And like all stories, how much of it is based on reality and how much is based on fiction? The stories we want to tell ourselves, right? The stories we've heard from other people about you know, what we did when we were two or three. My kids love to hear stories about what they did when they were babies, you know, because for them, that's part of their way of identifying with that person in a photo. Um, it's a story. And like all stories, it can be sometimes a house of cards when you look too closely at like what's real and what's made up. Yeah. Beautiful, everybody. All right. So Olivia said, so is the reason they wanted to do this play? So is that the reason they wanted to do this play? So that they know their past moments happened and they want the judgments of their memories? Um, so I do, I do think that they want judgment towards their memories. They're acting this out. They, they're like, the, the girl is so adamant about everyone seeing how the father really is and how he's portrayed when he's by himself with just the girl and his like perversion and what's wrong with them. I don't know if they, um, if they don't like know their past moments. I think they think they're like, as, as characters, their role is to act as these characters and, and portray this situation. So I think they know their situation already, but they definitely want judgment of others. They want and whether that's because they're characters and they're just, you know, as almost actors, they want like other people to find their like performance entertaining or like in the stepdaughter situation, she just wants people to see the father for how she sees him as not some man who's like, um, you know, modest, who took in a family that was poor, but actually as someone who's like, who's a creep essentially. So yeah, I think judgment plays a, a big part in this. I think it connects to question two also, when the son says that he'll play nothing and I think it's because he doesn't want to be judged for what he's done. And he's trying to shy away from like actually owning up to what happened and owning up to reality. Yeah, excellent. I was really happy that um, Kyle and George included a question on the son because he's so overlooked, you know? <laughs> um, he's one of those characters where because of his very existence, you know, and that's, that's what the stepdaughter kept saying. He ultimately, it was his presence that made the mother, right, so intent on trying to win him back that she, for a moment, wasn't paying attention to her other two younger children. And, and because of her divided attention, you know, these two younger children died, basically. Um, and to me, it's really significant. Why, why did these two young children have to die, you know? What, what's the significance for Parandella? Why have the two youngest characters um, die? And how did they die? Did any of you, or were any of you confused about exactly how, what led to their deaths? So I think the young girl, I think she died because she was drowned. And I think the boy was shot by the, um, the son. And I kind of think he includes both of these characters because they obviously they don't talk. They don't really play any like essential role, but they're in the, they're in the background the entire time. And it's kind of ironic how the mother like turns her attention away from these two children that she like gives almost all of her attention to in order to um, like appease the son. And in mm -hmm. return, the son kills those two, those two kids that, that, you know, she loves. So I think it's, it's interesting that Parandello um, includes them. I'm not, I, I'm not, honestly, I'm not ex exactly sure why, he would include them in the story. So if anyone has any insight on that, I'd like that. Yeah, did, did you all get, I mean, how is the son responsible for their deaths? Does, and if so, in what ways? I mean, this gets a little confusing, right? Um, so I originally thought <clears throat> they committed suicide, both of them, but I, I must have missed something when I was reading it. Um, but now that you say that, I, I want to like kind of compare these characters to what you know, people actually act like, uh, almost like as like in a spitting image of what like the human condition is. Um, so in, in a way, I think that the kids die because the son is jealous of, you know, the fact that he was sent away uh, to another, like a nurse, right? What was it? Mm -hmm. It's like, so she, he <laughs> wasn't even, yeah, he wasn't even raised by his parents. Um, and I think that that lack of a emotional connection for him kind of made him really upset when he saw like new kids, you know, he's like, wow, my mom can raise these kids and have a relationship with them. But, you know, it, it, he almost got like selfish. And um, I think that's what drove him over the edge 
like how how we are super selfish about everything in our life and i don't know yeah well, keep in mind that laura yeah go ahead well keep in mind that the sun has always seemed very uh different than the rest of the group even when they first came in it said that uh the mother and the stepdaughter they were in mourning i forgot exactly what the uh, young children were wearing uh the uh, the father looked presentable the son is the only one who had clashing colors and it's very distracting and i think we are going to get into the question later but um he refuses to act he doesn't want to take part so it sets him aside from all of them just like when you first meet him as a reader there's something else i was going to say too but i have forgotten my train of thought yeah so it does it does get a little confusing if you take a look on page 69 um 68 and 69 the stepdaughter almost like frantically i mean i think she's really on the edge of of a kind of, of, of a breakdown here i mean she's almost um manic and uh She's setting up, she sets up the fountain and she, Rosetta, the little girl, she brings her over to the fountain and um, she says, you know, look how beautiful the water is and there are ducks, the little ducklings swimming about. And then she says, uh, you want to take hold of one of these ducklings, dot, dot, dot. And it's at that moment, then then she goes um, with a shout that fills everyone with dismay. No, no, my Rosetta, your mother is not looking after you because of that beast of a son. And so there's the, you know, we get an indication that she was drowned, um, maybe because she was at the fountain and she was trying to reach for a duckling and tumbled in. Um, and then the son, what is the responsibility of the son? The son resists, he doesn't want to leave because he's the one that runs down and he's the one that finds um, the, the young girl on page 72. I ran out, I started to fish her out, but all of a sudden I stopped. Behind those trees, I saw something that froze me. The boy, the boy was standing there quite still. There was madness in the eyes. He was looking at his drowned sister in the fountain. And so there's, right there, there's some uncertainty. Um, did she drown because she was trying to reach for a duckling? Did the little boy have something to do with it? We don't know. Um, the stepdaughter who has been over the fountain hiding the little girl is sobbing desperately like an echo from the bottom. I started to approach and then from behind the trees where the boy was hiding, a revolver shot rings out. So it seems to me that the son, from what I can understand, the little boy got a, you know, shot himself in the head um, as the son was approaching him. Um, and that the part of the reason perhaps that the son doesn't want to have any part of this play is because again, he was the one who finds the young girl. And he's the one who approaches the little boy who eventually shoots himself and it's his participation that leads to this downfall, you know? Um, and, and then let's look, I mean, sometimes the symbolism, symbolism isn't very uh, hidden. <laughs> like it's a literal loss of innocence, right? These two young children are the most innocent of everyone in this family. And they're the ones who are killed off. Um, and so if there's a message here from Pirandello, it's that, you know, this toxicity of these relationships this um, wanting to blame other people, uh, this desire to exist. I mean, it's part of that, maybe part of accepting the judgment of others, George and Kyle, is that you, you have to lose your innocence too. Like think of preciousness. In order to be considered a woman, she has to lose her preciousness, right? And for, in order for these characters to exist in reality, they have to lose their innocence in a literal way. These two young children die. Um, maybe through nefarious means, maybe through suicide. Um, but it's really, it's quite, it's quite sad. Um, and it's quite shocking. Again, when you're watching it, you're sort of like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. Because it's, you, you kind of feel like it's going to be real. The minute I look and see the dead bodies on the stage, it's going to be real. Um, it's going to be real for all of them. And it's going to be real for you. Mm. Yeah. I think that's a good spot to tie into number two, which has to do with the sun. Um, so the question reads that we, we were asking why the sun refuses to play his role when all these other characters are so adamant and they're so like, profound that they want to. And so I kind of said that I believe the sun plays nothing because he doesn't want to recreate the experience that he's lived. 
um, step, the stepdaughter and the father, they're eager to, you know, recreate their scenes, but the boy, he's quiet. He refuses to ask. He asks the director even if he can leave. Um, he's, he's even proud, he even says that he's proud that he isn't willing to act out a scene. But then later when he's forced to, um, he's like, he becomes ashamed of like the cycle of acting out his crimes. He, like, and so I think it kind of ties into the end of the story when the stepdaughter steps off the play, off the stage and the son is, is stuck on it. And even earlier when he wants to leave and he, he literally can't walk off the stage. So he's, he's like stuck in this, like the cycle, I guess, of acting out his story because he refuses to accept that he was there and that was him in that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of us can identify with that, right? Um, when something really traumatic happens, that, that level of denial that it's actually happened, right? So you can see that son playing in that level of denial, all these other characters for there are other reasons. I think maybe the mother is also resistant. She really doesn't want this to come true either, you know? Um, but at the same time, she talks about how these two children haunt her. They're fought like ghosts, you know? And so on one level, she doesn't want to experience the moment of their death because that would make it real. But on the other level, that's the only way she can get rid of these ghosts. Um, so she has this kind of, you can see her struggle as well. Um, the son says something really interesting on page 71 about the father. It was he, the father, who wanted to come dragging the rest of us with him and then getting together with you to plot not only what really happened, but also as if that did not suffice, what did not happen. Um, so I think part of the son too is that whatever is happening on this stage, it's not, it's not just reality or the way that he remembers it. I think he thinks that the father wants to, like we've seen the father wants to kind of twist reality around to fit his narrative. So if our realities are basically stories, right? This is why for some of us who've grown up in families where, I mean, I, I realized this very early on when my parents got divorced, um, they both had radically different stories about what had happened and also who was the victim and who was the bad person. Does that make sense, everybody? And this is with the very moment, you know, this is when I was 10, 11, 12 years old. And I started to think, man, this is really crazy. Like how, what is, I, I started to question my real, like what is reality? Who's, who's at fault and who's, the, you know, who am I supposed to support and who am I? I mean, it was this really confusing um, period of time for me, realizing that people can have all these really radically different realities. Um, and uh, so it reminds me of, of this play that the son is saying what did not happen. And I think how much of that do we do? You know, when even the stories about you as a baby, even those pictures of you when you were younger, how much of your memories are based on actual events and how much of, the, of them are the retelling of those events? It's, um, I know that gets a little bit like, ah, <laughs> you know, the abyss, ah. scary. What about question number three? I thought this was a really interesting like way to elaborate. I think it like takes it a step farther than what we've discussed for number one. Um, and philosophy right now we're learning about pre-reflexive and reflexive consciousness. And I think that, you know how you're saying like everything that we experience is a story now, like once it's in the past, it's like an illusion. Mm -hmm. So like in pre-reflexive consciousness, we're just like living in the moment. We're not aware of like, what we're doing, we're just kind of living. And then once we're in reflexive consciousness, we can reflect. And that's when things start to like become illusions because you know, we have our own stories. Like they're not always, we don't want to like, what, I, what came to mind for me is like, when you look back at something that's like really embarrassing that's happened to you, you like try to talk yourself out of like, oh, that wasn't that embarrassing because this happened and this happened. But like the people who are there are just gonna think it's embarrassing. Like they're not gonna try to make excuses for you or anything. So like from their eyes, it's still like really embarrassing. and. I thought this was even um, connected to the story when the father, like, to me, I think the father knew who the stepdaughter was, like, when he went to have sex with her, just because, like, he stalked her, like, she was still young, like, I feel like there's good evidence to say that he didn't know, but I think that he was trying to talk himself out of thinking that it was her to, like, make himself feel better, and I think that's an illusion, too, and I just think that's how we can, like, play with our experiences and play with like our past to like make ourselves feel better about things when really like that's not reality yeah yeah I mean it's how we get through the night right sometimes it's how we 
can look at ourselves in the mirror is um, by reshaping and reframing and distorting the story so that it can fit in with the illusions we have about the kind of person we are. And uh, you can see that in the notes from underground, you know, the underground man was trying, I mean, <laughs> He's a pretty horrible character. I, I don't disagree. Like he says, I'm the anti-hero here because he's trying deliberately to try to tell things as honestly as possible so he doesn't come off looking heroic because that's our natural inclination. We want to reframe things in a way that make us seem heroic and good and virtuous and smart or whatever, right? Um, and uh, for better or for worse, he was he, he was trying to, to be as, as unromantic as possible. Um, and we see it here, we see the different characters struggling, the father to be, you know, wanting to be seen as better than he maybe possibly actually is. The stepdaughter wants to uh, shine a light on her stepfather's behavior. Um, the son doesn't want to participate because, you know, he's, he doesn't want the reality for his father, this father that he hates, right? He hates his father. And if this putting on this play is going to help his father uh, make his father look better. Like he said, I don't, I don't want to participate in this if this is going to make my father look like a better guy, you know, <laughs> like, so they all have their reasons for, you know, for framing this in a way that either benefits or doesn't benefit themselves. And um, this is another technique of modern writing. So around the, the turn of the century between World War I and World War II, and this is when we have, especially after World War II, the kind of um, eruption of existentialism. Pirandello is seen as a, a for, another forefather to more absurdist plays and um, you know, drama, especially that deals with this idea of uh, a play is supposed to mimic reality. Well, what if a play really mimics reality, right? What if, you know, what if we have a play that is really asking us not just reflecting reality, but really asking us what is our reality and who are we really in a way that destabilizes those narratives that we have running in our brain. Doesn't confirm it, it like destabilizes. Um, yeah, so nice, nice job everyone. Did anyone wanna add on any comments, um, any questions? Because we've got our experts here. We've got Kyle and George who can, who can help answer. Did anyone have any questions about what happens at the very, very end of this play? Yeah, I could get some more clarification. Yeah, it's, it's really creepy when you watch it. Um, so the children die and then we see this sort of eerie backdrop um, and the characters are there, they're illuminated, but they're all sort of standing on the stage. And then this is what it says. Last of all, from the right, the stepdaughter comes out and runs toward the two stairways. She stops on the first step to look for a moment at the other three and then breaks into a harsh laugh before throwing herself down the steps. She runs down the aisle between the rows of seats. She stops one more time and again laughs, looking at the three who are still on stage. She disappears from the auditorium and from the lobby, her laughter is still heard. Shortly thereafter, the curtain falls. So what do you think is, what what's going on with that? I think it's significant that they include the laughter as heard from the lobby because we kind of get this this sense that as soon as these characters are outside of their view, they just disappear. They're not real. And by including the fact that you can hear her in the lobby, it kind of infers that she's still alive even after she's out of you know the view of this of the stage and this this act. So it kind of shows that like she has her life. She she she's no longer a character in a way. She's now an, she's now an actor. She's a person. So I think it's kind of relevant that Parandello includes that that while these other three are stuck on stage and they're not they can't leave. They're they're like they're forced to stay there because they can't accept their version of they can't accept their reality. She she was able to do that, and so now she's free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so creepy. I have to say because you're sitting there and you're watching, and this character goes running past you sort of laughing maniacally. And she's already a scary character, you know? <laughs> and then you can hear her. And, and then like, that's the end of the play. And you're like, you know, like, what's going on? And I have to admit, you know, my husband and I were getting ready to go out and we're sort of looking around like, it's scary. Like, is she gonna be there? <laughs> you know, like, is she gonna be by our cars? I mean, it was, it was again, really destabilizing because it was like this person has been created and just unleashed 
onto the world. And uh, it's it's a really, uh, again, it's really, really playing with this idea of, you know, not only does he break the fourth wall, I mean, he totally smashes that thing. <laughs> there is no fourth wall anymore because that character is like George says, now she's a person with freedom. And who knows, right? Like what's destabling, destabilizing is that when you go see a play, everything's already scripted out. Like character's supposed to do X, Y, Z, the curtain falls, that's the end of the illusion. And now there is no end to the illusion because she's out there and there's no script for her either. She's got freedom like you do, George, like you do, Kyle, like you do, Olivia, she's got freedom. Um, and, and that makes it seem creepier and um, more dangerous, you know? And, uh, and I think Pirandello is also asking us to think about our own freedom, right? Like the father says to the producer, um, there's this really great quote. When father says, a character, sir, can always ask a man who he is because a character really has his own life marked with his own characteristics by virtue of which he is always someone. Whereas a man, I'm speaking of you now, you Kyle, you Reagan, you Jamari, he's speaking to us now. A man can be no one. What the hell is he trying to say there? When he says a character is always by virtue of which he is always someone and humans, we are no one. What is that distinction that he's trying to make there? I think it has something to do with like existentialism and just our, you know, the whole existentialist view is that you are nothing and you make something of yourself through your choices. So as a character, they're, they're something because they can't make choices. They're living a, a role that's already been decided for them. But as humans, we have this, um, you know, we have freedom to choose every decision for ourselves and make something of ourselves. Yeah, beautiful. Yep. Um, and think about, you know, this is something the underground man said as, as well, right? He said like a man in the 19th century, a human in the 19th century can't, you know, if they're at all conscious, they realize they don't have any characters, you know, like they don't have an, a fundamental character that they're always changing, that they're always evolving. Um, and, and the father says uh, on 61, the director says, of course, my reality changes. It changes all the time, like everyone else's, right? That's what the director says. And the father with a cry, but ours does not. You see, that is the difference. It does not change. It cannot ever change or be otherwise because it's already fixed. It is what it is, just that forever. A terrible thing, sir, an immutable reality. You should shudder to come near us. And, and this is really significant to me because, um, you know, usually again, <laughs> what existentialism is trying to blow up is this idea that things are fixed, that your nature is fixed, that you have a fixed immutable soul, that reality is fixed and immutable, that um, the path that you're on is fixed and, and immutable, that the, everything happens for a reason, that you know there's a, such a thing as fate. Like existentialism wants to blow that up. And, and you know, even the underground man says, people don't like that. People want to hold on, right, to this feeling that everything's already been laid out, that their path has already been chosen, that their job is to figure out what path God wants for them and then stay on that. Does that make sense, everybody, right? It gives people a lot of feelings of comfort to think um, this is all happening for a reason and I am who I am and I'm forever. And after I die, I'm gonna exist some, you know, this me is never gonna disappear. It's always been here and it'll always be here. You know, like what a comforting thought. You know, you can imagine being my child when Charlotte, who's my little existentialist, um, at five, six, seven, uh, she would ask me on a routine basis, um, what happens after we die? And she would ask, you know, this is, you know, like, you're going to die, mom. And I'm like, yeah. She goes, and I'm going to die. And I'm like, yeah. And she goes, so what happens? And of course, I'm an existentialist. So, well, not entirely, but, you know, I've studied all this and I'm going, um, <laughs> you know, I was like, well, let me go through the different belief systems because that's the way I am. Like, this is what Christian and Christians believe. And this is what Jewish people believe. And this is what Hindus believe. And this is what Buddhists believe. And, you know, I'm going through all of this. And I'm um, like, I think that what you, and, and this is what science believes, right? And, and you can, you, you can pick, you can kind of choose here. You can kind of choose the one that you feel like gives you a feeling of, of maybe comfort. But I, I just have to be honest, no one really knows. No one really knows. People have faith, but they don't really know. And, um, 
And that's a really hard thing is a, is a, I mean, should I have lied to her? I don't know. Y'all tell me if I'm being, I, like I said, I'm winging the whole mothering thing. Like, you know, I'm winging it. I don't know. Um, but she, it says here, like for the father, what this exes, you know, what this play is trying to say is that it's actually the opposite that we should fear. It's actually, actually the opposite that we should, that we should shudder to be around, which is, what if it were true that you could never change, Olivia? What if, what if it were true that you had a set destiny and that you were on this path forever, that you really didn't have freedom, that you didn't have free will, that if you were going in this direction, there was nothing you could do to stop it? Does that make sense? Like, wouldn't that be worse? I know a lot of people want to believe that because it gives them a sense of comfort, but this play, I think, is trying to throw that all up in the air. Like, actually, that's much, much worse. That's much more petrifying, or it should be to us that everything is set in stone and that we have this path that we're supposed to go down and other people can judge us and, and make us do what they want us to do. Does that make sense, Olivia? Like for the characters, that's a much worse fate than having this freedom. Um, however messy it is and however, uh, how hard it is and how difficult it is, it's much, much worse for these characters to be stuck in this loop, in this reality, in which they have very little freedom of choice. Um, yeah, sorry, that was really long. Sorry about that. So yeah. Nick says, we all change all the time, so we can never be a single thing because we're in a constant state of change. And that I agree with that. And it kind of shows like to the problem of what the characters have right now. Um, you see how like adamant the characters are about having props that look exactly the same as what they, uh, they they perceive them to be as they were like written by the author and so even while the father says you know look how terrible we have it we're in this fixed state they're still like they're still um attached to this idea that they have to have everything in this fixed state they have to have like the exact same table as in the play so while they don't want to be in this like this fixed like state they they're almost like their identity is is around that and they can't leave it yeah, same thing with Gregor, right? When they start taking furniture out of his room. That's when at that point when he sort of doesn't want them to because his stuff, his environment helps to keep that narrative, right? And for some of us, that's why it's so destabilizing maybe uh, when you move out of your childhood home or you are now living on a campus that part of the way that we keep up this narrative of our body changing over time that it's the same person is because we are so familiar with this environment. Does that make sense, everybody? Once you change that environment, it really throws you for a loop, you know? Um, it definitely, I felt like when I lived in, in another country that um, it was one of the, the first times when, and I wasn't around my family, I wasn't around my, my identical twin sister, and it, it was really, really bizarre. I mean, it was, it was such a moment of freedom. I really literally could be anyone because there was no one there who shared my history, no one there who knew me before. And it was really, well, it, was, it was awesome, but it was also very scary. I highly recommend it, by the way, once you graduate from college. With a degree from this country, you could probably, you can teach English just about anywhere, just FYI. So if you're ever interested in that, come. I, I got a couple of my students to, to travel and teach in other countries. Um, so Anyway, if you're interested, let me know because uh, it is an amazing experience and you'll never feel with such complete freedom because you've got nothing tying you to your former self. It's very bizarre and cool and frightening and dangerous. All right, uh, I'm really not selling it, am I? Uh, how about anybody else, Caitlin? Um, Autumn, I'm so sorry you have to stay here for basketball. That's kind of sucky. Um, Wade, Elena, Alexia, Brooke, anybody? Jamari, do you want to jump in? Reagan, do you want to jump in and say anything? Ask any questions? You all happy? Um, I kind of like thinking of like the third question where he's talking about like how it's all kind of like an illusion or whatever. I can't even remember like the exact wording. It made me think like he's saying that basically or how I took it was basically like you're living like each day is like your reality but like once it passes it's just like an illusion because you kind of just fill in all the blank spaces so why is he like so adamant about them living like out their story even though technically if 
like that quote if like he's like referring to like what they're doing like in real life then like aren't they just living an illusion themselves so why does it really matter who's actually like performing the play yeah I think that's a good point I think that you know they'll be able to play themselves more accurately and also like in the father and stepdaughter situation they were there to hold each other accountable and um yeah I don't know I, I think it is hypocritical too to think that but Yeah, I think partly it's um, what he's trying to convince the humans, the actors and the director on the stage is that you are taking illusion and you're making it real. But for you, reality is actually an illusion, you see? So it's like, so, you know, uh, so they're taking an illusion to make it real, even though honestly, it's actually an illusion. And, and that's what I think what the father is trying to get all of us to see. And again, remember at the end, they talk about Pirandello as being a man who hated writing. I mean, he hates play. He hates the fiction that dramas <laughs> will try to convince us um, that, that our realities are this stable force, right? So you've got Pirandello writing all of these plays and he doesn't really want his plays to do what plays are historically supposed to do, which is reconfirm this idea that we're the stable character. I mean, they keep talking about that, right? Like at the same time that the daughter is drowning, the son is up in the bedroom with the mother, right? And then at the same time that that's happening and that's happening, then the stepdaughter is over here. And does that make sense, everybody? I mean, think about that. Like right now, my daughter is in school and my other daughter is at high school and my, my husband's teaching. And all of those realities are happening simultaneously. But every time we read a novel, there's this chronological time that this happens and then this happens and then this happens. And we watch a movie, you can't have all those scenes going on at the same time, or it's really hard to do that at the same time. And so again, what we tend, you know, what our art does to us, whether it be drama or movies or reading books, it flattens out our experiences so that there's sort of, you know, only one experience counts at a time. Does that make sense? Only one experience counts at a time. And, uh, you know, Pirandello is again, questioning all of that. Like this drama, I know that what you want from this drama is to have one experience count at a time. You want it to be from one person's perspective, either the fathers or the mothers or the stepdaughters, but for the love of God, pick one, you know? <laughs> and you want one of the scenes to happen. And, and what Pirandello is saying is that a drama can't possibly do that. It can't possibly ever, you know, replicate reality accurately. There's just no way. Um, we, we go to those, we watch our movies and we watch our plays and we read our books because it gives us a comforting sense that that's how reality works, but it's, it can't possibly ever mimic reality or art. Um, so kind of it starts to ask, even in here, it starts to ask, what is it good for? So Reagan, your, your question about what does it matter if it's all illusion, right? What does it matter who plays them? And, and yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, really big point. Like, why does any of this matter then, <laughs> you know, like for any of us and, and please hang on to this class because we will answer those questions later. But yeah, you should be existentialists or that's all the, one of the questions they're always asking. I mean, that's what Charlotte asked me at seven years old. Like, so I'm gonna die. We don't know what happens after. I'm here for this really short time. And I remember at seven, she's like, so what am I doing here? Like, what is the purpose of all this anyway? And I was like, oh, Jesus, really at seven? <laughs> like, could you give me a couple more years, kid? But it's true, that's where your brain goes, right? Like, why does any of this matter? If it's all an illusion and we're all just telling our stories and we don't even know what's real, like what the hell are we here for? Um, it's a really great question, Reagan. I didn't, you didn't know you were getting so deep and philosophical, but it's a really great question. Did we, Kyle and George, did we ask, did we answer all of the questions that you put on the discussion board? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, so again, thanks for, thanks for taking this journey with me. Six characters in search of an, I mean, Pirandello is one of my absolute favorites, but it really screws with your brain. So um, thanks for, for coming on this journey with me. Some of my classes, they either really get this play or they're like, uh-uh, 
we're checking out. Like, this is just too crazy. This is, this is Looney Tunes. Um, next, uh, I think on Monday, does anyone have a presentation going on Monday? Do we know? Ah, Laura, okay. Um, Laura, how do you wanna conduct that? Do you uh, want to run, uh, do a discussion board like other students have done and then discuss the questions in class on Monday? Do you want, we could do a Zoom if you'd rather like lead the discussion on a Zoom. Um, you could even, I know that you haven't been coming to class, which I totally, totally get, but you could do what uh, Nick did the other day and kind of come to class and lead it from the classroom. But I know uh, if you don't feel comfortable, I completely understand. What, what do you think you'd like to do, Laura? Uh-oh. Laura, did we lose you? We might have lost her. Okay. Um, well, I'll get I'll get an answer from Laura. I'll let everybody else know about uh, what's going to happen on Monday, and I'll get something up for you. Um, you should know what the reading is according to the what's the reading next? I don't ever know. I should know this, right? I think it's the stranger. <gasps> Correct. Oh, oh, the stranger is so awesome. I'm I'm really yeah. excited to see what you all do with that. To answer, to answer your question, y'all, uh, I'm trying to type. I just can't type very fast, but I don't mind doing the discussion board or doing a Zoom or leading, leading it like in class personally. It just depends on when I can actually get the questions out. Cool. I mean, it's, it's totally, I mean, Laura, you let me know, email me. Does anybody have a preference for what we do? Oh, it doesn't, it really doesn't matter to me. So um, well, hopefully I'll get those questions to you no later than Sunday. I'm actually really busy this weekend. Um, I'm to, in short words, I am almost done with rifle drill training. I might become full certified. So Yay! that's taking up my day tomorrow <laughs> from sunrise Yay! to sunrise, literally. So. Okay. Well, you let me know. Um, luckily, the stranger is a very short read. It's um, it's so stark and bare. So uh, I look forward to it. it. Yeah, it won't take. Hopefully, it won't take too much time. Um, in fact, you might read it and go, "Oh my God, what's going?" On? It's very. It's a very strange novel. Um, so, Laura, let me know if you can get those questions to me. Great. Uh, if not, I can always throw up some questions for like a journal, and then in class you could present other questions. Does that make sense, Laura? If that takes a little bit of stress off of yeah, you. Yeah, no problem. So let me know, and uh, and I'll get that up to everyone. Okay, everybody, take care. Have a great weekend. Thanks, George. Thanks, Kyle. You were awesome. Bye. Bye, bye, Dr. everybody. Falls, before before uh, before we sign off, I have a quick question for you. Yeah. 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 So um, in regard to the third and final project, um, when is that due? Well, they, the administration has been uh, reluctant to give us dates. So typically they have like a final exam schedule that they tell us, you know, your class is supposed to have exams and blah, blah, blah. So for me, um, that final exam week, I'm, I'm I'm going to say anytime between you know Wednesday to Friday of that final exam week. So it's going to be very open and kind of loosey goosey, if that makes sense, Wade. So yeah. um, so it's the second week in December, uh, and uh, basically until that Friday at five o'clock. I mean, I'm going to be very, very, very flexible with it, um, so people can take it if they're you know if they want to take it early in the week and just get it done with, right? If they want to you know, take the whole week to, to write or do their project, that's fine too. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. So what, um, what sort of, if I'm doing the project on the comparison between the flies and the Oristaya, um, what kind of format do you think would be good? And do you think I could have that be my presentation? Because I'm kind of interested in uh, sharing that as well. Yeah, I think that would be, that would be really, really awesome. Um, I would say probably, I think I've given two days to do Myth of Sisyphus, uh, but I think the class will probably be able to, to cover the myth in, in probably one, one and a half class, class periods. Um, 
so when you when you gave a sort of presentation on on that, um, you know, my only suggestion would be to recognize that not everybody has written has read the plays so that when you make the comparisons, you might want to bring in what we have read so far, Wade. Yeah. And, and especially no exit, because I think there's a lot of overlap with that too. Um, and maybe just kind of get them interested in seeing the connections between Greek literature and other plays that Sartre has, has uh, read. I might even do like an extra credit journal, like read the flies and write a journal in, in that way. Um, maybe some people can join in on the discussion. It's a really short play. It's like no exit, but um, yeah. yeah. So some people might be interested in that. So let me know and I can kind of set that up for everybody. If you're going to do a presentation, probably it should go, it should happen before the end of the semester. I don't want to do that to people during their final exam week because I think they're going to be too busy and crazy. Um, right. So we'd have to probably put that in maybe the last day of class. Okay, so should I, would I need, um, I couldn't figure out how to sign up for a oh, presentation it's, aside it's on, from that. Yeah, it's on one of our pages. If you go to pages on the left, um, the, the, if you click like pages is like over by announcements and assignments. If you go to pages, you click on that, there'll be a presentation sign up and, and basically you, you uh, click edit, add your name, and then save it at the bottom. Gotcha. Okay. So would that, would that be, would I need to sign up for an additional presentation on one of the main pieces of literature? Would that be, would that be both the project or would that like cross over between the project and the I think, I think that would definitely cross over because you're reading, you're reading and, and producing more than, um, than anybody else, if that makes sense. Because yeah. you're reading an additional plays and making those connections, then that will count for both the essay and the presentation grade. I think that, I think that could work. Gotcha, sounds good. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I think it's gonna be really interesting. Excellent, okay, good, good. So um, why don't you go ahead and, and see if you can find the, the pages on our Canvas and uh, sign up for that last day of class and then I'll, I'll give you free reign. It'll be on a Zoom. So, um, so you can make that presentation on a, on a Zoom like this, like today. And that, there you go. All right, well, sounds good. Thank you very much, I appreciate okay. it. All right, no problem, Wade, take care. You too, bye. Okay.